In the last video, I introduced the bag adder measure, and I proved a couple of properties of it. First, that it's monotonic, which was pretty easy, and then that it was sigma subadditive, which was a little bit more involved, but not too much work either. So the Lebesgue adder measure is the infimum of the sum of, uh, of volumes of, of boxes, or, or in, in one dimension, it's just the lengths of intervals that cover E. So if we look at at this blue set E, we can imagine a bunch of these green intervals that cover E and take the length and then take the smallest uh, possible cover and that would be the outer measure of E. Alright, I want to prove another nice property of this, uh, this measure. So, theorem. The Lebesgue outer measure of E is the same as the infimum of the Lebesgue outer measure of O such that O is open and E is contained in O. Alright, so basically instead of taking a bunch of intervals and we don't know if they're open or closed or half open or what, we can just take the smallest possible open set that contains uh, E. So let's say this is our real line here. And that's, well, actually, I don't know if I need to draw a picture of right now. First of all, I have one direction right away. And I ha the direction I have right away is this one here, I believe. Yeah, because the, the measure of E is the infimum of the sum of the sum of the volumes of I sub K. where I sub k are all intervals, I'm just going to assume that, and it covers E, okay? And that's going to be less than or equal to the infimum of the M star of O, such that O is open and it contains E, because if we have an open interval, then every open interval can be written as the union of a bunch of countably many disjoint open intervals. Or every open set can be written as the union of countably many disjoint open intervals. And so automatically every uh, every open set can, can generate a cover of E with the same measure. And a theorem we didn't uh, prove, but, but it should be fairly obvious, is that the uh, measure or the length of an interval or that the measure of an interval is going to be the same as the length of that interval. The Lebesgue outer measure of either an open or a closed interval is the same as its length. It's a little involved to prove, and it's not really necessary because it's, it's fairly obvious and straightforward. But anyway, this is the infimum over a larger set because every cover here generates a cover here, but not vice versa because we could have uh, maybe closed intervals or, or intervals that for some other reason are not open. Okay, so to get the other direction, what I want to show is that uh, this thing is greater than or equal to that. Well, if, um, if the m star of e is equal to infinity, I'm done. It's automatically greater than or equal to that. Otherwise, given given epsilon greater than zero, I can uh, I can choose a family I sub k family of, of intervals such that uh, the such that well first of all it covers E certainly and the sum, oops, I need to write the sum, the sum across all k of the volume of i sub k is less than or equal to, or let me just go strictly less than, just, just to be safe, m star of e plus epsilon over 2 to the k, well, let me just say epsilon over 2. 
so that we'll, need, we'll get our K back in later. Epsilon over 2. Alright, now it, it's almost tempting to think that we could get 1 equal to M star of epsilon. Right, but we can't actually do that because M star of epsilon is the infimum of all of these covers. There isn't necessarily a cover that actually has that measure. You just get arbitrarily close to it from above. Okay, well then each interval, as of K, maybe is a closed interval, or maybe a half an open interval, who knows. But what I can do is when I have an interval like that, I can take an open interval that's just a little bit bigger. And so I'm going to go just a little bit out on both sides. I'm going to take an open interval. So for each i sub k, take an open interval uh, i sub k prime containing i sub k such that the the measure of or the volume of i sub k prime is less than or equal to and we're going to make it really really close we're going to make it less than or equal to the volume of i sub k plus epsilon over 2 to the k plus 1 and here's where, where the k plus 1 comes in that we're going to use let me just write that a little more clearly Okay, less than or equal to the volume of i sub k over 2 to the k plus 1. Now, these i sub k primes form an open cover. Because each one contains i sub k, and, and the i sub k's form an open cover, so this cover, or not necessarily open, covers E. And let O equal the union of all k of these i sub k primes. Then O is open. And furthermore, the outer measure of O looks like I have some leftover stuff from a previous video down here. Try to get rid of that. The outer measure of O is less than or equal to the sum across all K of these i sub k prime, right? Because the outer measure of O is the infimum of all of the sums of the length of all the covers. And this is one example of such a cover. But this thing right here is less than or equal to the sum across all k of v sub i sub k plus epsilon over 2 k plus 1, which is equal to the sum across all k of the volume of i sub k plus the sum of all sub k of this thing right here, which ends up yielding epsilon over 2. Now, we showed, we already assumed that the sum of the volume of i sub k is less than or equal to the Lebesgue outer measure of E plus epsilon over 2, and now we're adding epsilon over 2 to that again, and what we end up getting is the Lebesgue outer measure of E plus epsilon. I think we actually specified that this would be strictly less than, so we'll make this inequality strict here. And then we have strict inequality. Okay, so that shows that this theorem is true, so I can go ahead and draw my little box here. Hooray! I love true theorems. Okay, and the Theorem again, let me just state what we just proved is that the the big outer measure is equivalent to taking the smallest open set that contains E. Alright. Now one other thing I want to say about the big outer measure is that if there especially based on this theorem that we've just shown. And a nice little consequence of this is that given I'll just, I'll just write this as a fact it's very easy to prove from what we just did in fact it's almost almost equivalent to what we just did okay so given epsilon greater than zero 
there exists O, some open set O containing E, such that, let's see, some open set O containing E such that the outer measure of O is less than or equal to the outer measure of E plus epsilon. Alright? That's just based on the definition of the outer measure of E as the infimum of such O, or of such outer measures of O. Alright, so if we have a, um, let's say this is a real line, now the real line apparently has turned red, and then disappeared, I don't know why, because a tablet is, is acting up, that's okay, we'll turn it black, we'll show it, or not. Alright, so the outer measure, so, so let's then say this is our set E here. We'll make a green green little set here. Maybe it looks like that. I'm not trying to do two dimensions. And then we have some outer measure O. And let's say we had a pretty generous epsilon. So our, our open set O can be something like this. Right, there's a lot of empty space in between. But that's not a problem. And I'm going to use this lighter blue to represent the complement of, of E in O. And here's something that would be true uh, if we were in a measure, and we, we know that um, for, for sure um, O is equal to E union, uh, let's see, the complement of E and O, right? That's just by the fact that uh, E is a subset of O. Now if, if the outer, outer measure were a measure, a real one, then this would be additive. So the measure of O would be equal to the measure of E unit of the measure of E plus the measure of O minus E, or the complement of E and O. And we would know that, that the measure of the complement of E and O is therefore less than epsilon because the, the measure of O is less than or equal to the measure of E, not a measure of E plus epsilon. So there would exist some, we, we would have that there exists some O such that E is in O and the outer measure of, uh, let's see, the outer measure of O minus E is less than epsilon. Okay, that would be true if if um, O were actually a measure, or sorry, if, if the outer measure were actually a measure, just by the definition of a measure, the, the additivity part in particular. But this turns out to be not true. So this is not true, even though this here is true. Meaning that there there's some non-measurable set that has an open cover, such that uh, the the difference between uh, the open cover and the actual uh, the open the, and the outer measure of the set is uh, less than epsilon. Nevertheless, if you take the complement of that uh, set, that non-measurable set in in its open cover, you're going to get a measure greater than or equal to epsilon. So that's something that we should not expect to see, except in very strangely behaved sets, and, and of course, the sets that don't have any measure are very strangely behaved. But it turns out that this can actually characterize a nice sigma algebra of, of measurable sets. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let L equal the set of all E subsets of R such that there exists O open with E containing contained in O and the outer measure of O should that be a forward slash? No, I think it should be a backslash. It's kind of like division, right? O minus E is less than epsilon for all epsilon. So, so such that for all epsilon greater than zero, we should say. And that's going to be the definition of L. And what we're going to do 
is we are going to let m be m star restricted to l. That is, we're going to let m be a function from l to 0 infinity, where uh, for, all, uh, for all e in l, you would be an element of L since L is a collection of sets rather than a subset of L. For all E and L, the measure of E, and we'll define this actually to be the Lebesgue measure, is equal to the Lebesgue outer measure of E. And if E is not an L, well, we just won't worry about it. So we, we need to show that this is actually a measure, which requires two steps. We need to show, one, that L is a sigma algebra, and two, that m is a measure when we restrict it to this particular sigma algebra. And that's what we're going to do in the next couple of